What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the park, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the same. And right now, I feel like a hundred grand. You are listening to Inspired Insider with your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of inspiredinsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders. You know, when I was thinking about this uh, interview, John, uh, and I'll properly introduce John Morris for a second, uh, but uh, I was thinking, who are some of the top Chicago entrepreneurs I've had on the podcast before? And um, big shout out, first of all, to Steve Fretzen, Steve Fretzen of Sales Free Selling for Attorneys, who actually introduced us. So thanks, Steve. Everyone check out his website and his podcast. Um, I had Dan Zawacki of Lobstergram. He was the first person, I think, to send live lobsters in the mail for direct mail. Um, he's in Chicago. Peter Rahal I had on who started RX Bars. If you haven't heard of RX Bars, maybe you have seen them. But uh, he started that company. And John, when I had him on, I didn't realize how big they were. And, and shortly after, they sold to Kellogg. Uh, so that was a, a great story as well. So check those out on SpartInsider.com. And uh, before I introduce John Morris, uh, this episode is brought to you by Rise 25. At Rise 25, um, I founded it with my business partner, John Corcoran, and we help businesses launch and run their podcast for them. And really for me, over the past 10 years of podcasting, um, the number one thing is relationships. I'm always looking at ways to give to my relationships, to profile the people I admire, and have everyone else learn from them as well. And I've seen no better way to do that with a pot than with a podcast. So if you are a business and you've thought of, hmm, maybe I should get my message out, maybe I should get my network's message out to the world, um, you should. You should start a podcast. So go to rise25.com, learn more, um, and check it out. Uh, I'm excited about today's guest. We have John Morris. Again, thanks to Steve Fretzen. John Morris turned ten thousand dollars into one of the largest independent digital agencies called Rise Interactive. And Rise Interactive is a full service internet marketing agency. And they help people, uh, their clients, get new customers at the lowest acquisition cost. So, so John is a master at a lot of things, but he is a master at helping people get clients at low acquisition costs. Now he runs Ramsey Innovations where he helps business leaders grow their companies because John grew his company from zero to I think, over 250 people at, uh, at the end when you sold it. John, thanks for joining me. Thank you so much. By the way, I love the name Rise 25 as someone who founded Rise Interactive. And I, and I was looking at that. I'm like, I, we did not copy it. It, is, it is, predates <laughs> me knowing about you and Rise Interactive. But why yeah. did you name it Rise Interactive? You know, uh, our, our original name was actually Internet Marketing Initiative, which was always a placeholder name. And we were I like Rise trying, Interactive. Better. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's by far a superior name. But when it came to Rise, you know, if you think about, we helped people rise to the top of the search engines. We helped people rise in terms of their ROI. And so the idea is that we were trying to help people rise overall. And so the name fit perfectly. Yeah, I love the name too, as well. Yeah. And, you know, when we were talking before we hit record here, I do want to talk about the evolution of Rise Interactive because it leads into what you do now, which is, you know, leadership and uh, sales and marketing and all the aspects of someone running their business. But we are talking about, you're like, Jeremy, there's really three things that help businesses grow when I come into an organization that I, there's a low hanging fruit. So I'd love for you to, to talk about those. Absolutely. You know, uh, what I've noticed is that as I am talking to lots of small to medium sized businesses, the same problems seem to be reoccurring in terms of what is stunting their growth. Uh, the first is organizational design. So if you think about every business, every business sells something, they market it to help the sales team generate leads. They have operational infrastructure such as HR, legal, facilities, corporate IT, and they have financial related things. So they have to do all their accounting. And then they do something with client and customers. Every single business, does not matter what your industry is. But a lot of organizations are not structuring their talent in a way that is very clear and well-defined and scalable so that as the company gets bigger, we know that this group of people will handle this type of work. And so what ends up happening is there's overlap in people's doing their roles and responsibilities. 
Uh, there's not clear direction of who owns what. And so that's one major thing that we believe companies need help with is figuring out just how to organize their talent better. The second one, as it relates to helping you grow, a lot of people don't realize or think about this, is your financial infrastructure, okay? It is absolutely imperative that you do bottoms up budgeting, that you're able to look at things on a monthly basis as opposed to just an annual basis, and that you can look at, this is what I'm expecting my revenue to be by month. This is how many customers I need to achieve by month. Because then you can start looking at how you allocate your funds and how you can ensure you achieve those goals. And then the third thing is, uh, and this is really a philosophical thing, is that you need to build a sales and marketing infrastructure. You cannot wish growth to happen. Uh, there is one question that I ask every single client or prospective client, and that is what percent of your revenue do you dedicate to sales and marketing? What I found is most people, A, can't answer the question, or B, that they're not allocating nearly enough to achieve their goals. And so once we help them philosophically recognize that we're gonna to try to increase constantly the percent of revenue that goes to sales and marketing, then we start thinking about the infrastructure that's necessary. What are the people, the processes, the tools, uh, the outreach tactics that allow you to achieve those goals? I'm gonna start with that one and we'll go in reverse because I have some follow-up questions. So the building, you know, you can't wish sales and marketing. At Rise Interactive, what did you find was a good sweet spot? What was the percentage that you actually dedicated for sales and marketing? I'm curious of, you know, what were some of the things that moved the needle the most to get more customers. Yep. So, cause that's also what you did for people, John. So they, they'd yeah. hire you to do that. Uh, so I, I want to, from a proprietary standpoint, I don't think I can share the, the exact percent that rise spends on sales and marketing. Uh, but what I can tell you is a couple things. One, don't try to do everything. Pick a few things and do them incredibly well. So when you identify a play, Take that play and go all in on that play. So I'll talk about Ramsey and some of the things that we're doing here is uh, we are going all in on content marketing. You will see that if you follow my LinkedIn profile that I am posting every single day daily growth tips. Every week I have a high quality video in terms of talking about different things and teaching people uh, we, are, we are taking a content theme and we are turning that into a video, a blog post, an email, a social post. And so we're taking one theme and turning it into multiple pieces of content. And that is our, one of our big plays. The second one is that we are actually spending a lot on digital media. So we are driving traffic to our website and we're promoting the content that we are creating. Those are the two plays that we are following. Uh, and, and right now we are actually well ahead of our financial goals, even in a short time period. And it's really the impact of those two plays. You're speaking directly to me with, you know, same thing with a podcast. This one episode will go across 17 different channels. So I love what you said about creating that yeah. content and making it go across everywhere and then layering on top of it, um, driving traffic to it. Yep. Yeah. And I would just say that, you know, the starting point to your sales and marketing infrastructure starts with your target audience, okay? You cannot sell all things to all people. Uh, the hardest part about marketing is you actually have to say no to a lot of people because you want your messaging to be really targeted to one individual group. The way you define your target audience starts with your budget. If you have a really small budget, well, then you want to narrow your target audience. If you have a really large budget, you can expand. You can expand geographically or to multiple verticals. Uh, so that's the first element that you have to think about in terms of your target audience. Once you've defined your target audience, then what you need to start looking at is what makes you great for that specific target audience? Okay, what you're going to find is if you just start with analyzing all the competition, thinking about all the services or products that are necessary for that target audience, right off the bat, before you even have a really strong differentiator, you're going to be better than all the generalists. 
okay? Because you're gonna be focusing your services and your products to that specific group. So now that you're superior than generalists, now we have to think about is what's gonna make you greater than other companies that are not generalists that are going after that same audience, okay? And that's where you have to start thinking about innovation and how you make yourself unique. But then all of your outreach tactics will be going to that group of people. And so you should have a much higher win rate. And that's one of the things that you can do to help fuel, fuel your growth. I know, John, you know, there's always the evolution of this, you, you know, from Rise Interactive, probably the offerings and the, the customers you were going after were different from when you started from when you yeah. towards the end. Um, and I, I want to talk about that. But but let's talk about Ramsey Innovations for a second. Yep. Who right now? I like to ask two things. Who's an ideal client for you? Like who should be yep. listening? And then I'm wondering what topics you're choosing and some of your content because you're probably, you're, you know, obviously eating your own dog food and thinking, okay, here's yep. my ideal client. Here's what they want to hear. So yeah. who are the ideal clients? And then let's talk about some of the topics you're choosing in the content marketing that you're doing. Absolutely. So we are going after companies, I would say ranging between 2 million to about $30 million in annual revenue. Um, we're going after primarily companies in Chicago right now, uh, although we have clients nationally. Uh, and I'll explain our difference between our outreach approach versus who calls us. Uh, and then we are going after technology and professional service companies is primarily who we are targeting as who we want to win as customers at the moment. That being said, our offering works for multiple industries. And so we have people calling us across the board. We have interior design companies as clients, insurance companies as clients, IT providers as clients, data companies. So we have a wide mix of clients in, in different genres. Um, but there's a difference between who you choose to approach and who calls you. So can you help them is the starting point. And uh, there's a lot of people that we can help. Now, in terms of the content that we are developing, uh, right now, uh, a lot of the content that we're building because we're just getting out there is more framing of the story of who is Ramsey, what do we offer, what do we do? But what we are recognizing is, you know, Rams or sorry, Rise, you know, at the end of the day was a professional service organization, you know, so whether you are, um, uh, an agency, a law firm, an accounting firm, a management consulting firm, an IT integrator. Uh, at the end of the day, you're selling time, you're selling people's hours. And so a lot of the contents and a lot of the things that we're talking about are things that are going to make that group of people's world's lives easier. You know, we're, mm -hmm. we're also going to help those people grow faster. Yeah. So you're telling the background story now, people, you know, if you don't tell the background story, then they don't know your breadth of experience. You know, they just, yeah. it's just another person talking about some topic. So I would say, yes. What I would say right now, a huge part of the content of what we're doing is going to be starting to get very educational. So I talked about budgeting. We're going to be explaining what is the process of how do you do budgeting? How do you do, uh, how do you project revenue as a starting point? So there are three things you need to do to project revenue. It starts with your existing clients. What is your expectation in terms of revenue by month for every single client of yours? And you wanna do that by product and service. Once that's done, you wanna go into what I call named new clients. So these are prospective clients that you know who they are and you wanna project them out. And then you have to come up with what we call blue sky, which is revenue you don't know where it's gonna come from. And that ultimately helps you generate what you believe your budgeting number will be for revenue. Once you have that done, that's the foundation of your entire budgeting, but it's also the foundations of what you can invest in the companies. So that's an example of, we will be teaching people how to do that. We'll be teaching people how to define their target audience. We'll be teaching people how to uh, come up with outreach tactics, but the, but the outreach tactics is a perfect example of going after our target audience, the way you market for B2B is very different than the way you market for B2C. And the way you market for professional services is very different than the way you market for, let's just say, technology companies. So uh, we'll be talking about very specific tactics that go into the audiences that we're talking about 
in terms of here are the tactics and the outreach methodology that they should be going after. Yeah. So out of the three that help people grow, we just talked about, you know, you can't wish this, you have to build a sales and yeah. marketing engine. The second is the financial infrastructure. I, I'd love for you to talk about, you know, before we hit record, you're talking about chart of accounts and figuring out a percentage of revenue based on that. Yeah. Um, talk a little bit more about the financial in infrastructure. How can people budget, have a, a budget plan? Yeah. You know, so let me, so let me just explain real quickly what chart of accounts are. Most people don't haven't heard that term and they don't even understand why that term might be important as it relates to helping you grow. When you run an income statement or if you run a balance sheet, every single line is from something called a chart of accounts. Okay, so like if you get a, a, a bill for your cell phone from Verizon, you know, you might create a chart of account that says Verizon. You might create a chart of account that says phone. You might recreate a chart of accounts that says cell phone. Uh, and you might group them into different areas. Are you grouping that? So the idea is that uh, you want to group all of your expenses into a few different categories. So one of those categories is sales and marketing. And so if you want to ask, what percent of your revenue do you spend on sales and marketing? Well, your chart of accounts have to be lined up to be able to answer that question. Yeah. If it's not organized properly, then you won't get an accurate number there. Uh, you know, the CFO of Rise, who's one of the most talented people I've ever met, had a great comment to me. He's like, if I, as the CEO, had to do math in my head when looking at one of his reports, he wasn't doing his job right. Okay. So the idea is that if I ask you what percent of your revenue do you spend on sales and marketing and you have to look at a report and start doing math in your head, well, then you know the report is not structured properly. You should be able to answer that question within seconds, okay? The chart of accounts, organizing it properly will help you answer that question. Uh, the answer may differ, but I know you can't share the kind of behind the scenes at Rise Interactive, what the number was, but... Um, in general, what if you were to give people a general percentage of what uh, I guess you know it, it's going to be what is well, the right what the percentage the right of that you should spend? In, in in I'm like thinking in my head, what's he going to say? Well, he's going to say, well, it depends how fast you want to grow, right? But um, what, what is gonna, your recommendation? Yeah, it's it's really going to depend on your gross margin. Okay. Okay. So if you're in the software industry where you have tend to have a really high gross margin, uh, well, then you have more that you can invest in sales and marketing. If you are in an industry with a really low gross margin, then you're going to invest less in sales and marketing because there's less money available. So, uh, but what I would say is I would like to see minimally uh, between five to 10% of your revenue should be going to sales and marketing. If you're in like a technology and SaaS company, it's generally north of 20%. So it's oftentimes industry specific. Mm -hmm. But if you are sub 5% of your revenue into sales and marketing, uh, you're most likely just not going to grow quickly. You mentioned, you know, the financial infrastructure, which is key in the CFO. At what point Tell me a little about the evolution of you getting the finances and having the leadership in place at Rise. At what point do you hire a CFO into the company? So what I would say is... Because you bootstrapped Rise Interactive yeah. with a $10,000 investment. So I'd yeah. worry less about title and I would care more about just, you know, you know, Ramsey's a few months old and our books are in perfect order. We close the books every month within four business days of the month, previous month closing. Okay, and, and one of the things that we recommend from a financial infrastructure standpoint is that the faster you close the books at the end of every month, the faster you'll get insights in terms of how you're doing so that you know how to allocate your money to you know, future areas. Do you need to cut expenses, add expenses? Can you invest more? Uh, so you know whether you have a coordinator, a manager, a director, a VP, a C-suite uh, person who's in charge of your finances, the most important thing is take it seriously and recognize that this is going to give you an edge in terms of insights 
that are going to allow you to spend your time and your money to areas that are going to allow you to grow faster. And that's the most important thing is the insights that are gained for this so that you can grow at a faster rate. Mm -hmm. What do you do? Do you have, I'm wondering what you do on a tactical level. Do you have a meeting with the team at a certain point of the month to go over this? Do you get, have someone send you a report? What did it look like? I mean, now or at Rise Interactive? Sure. So uh, actually Ramsey has something called the Ramsey Financial System. So the first thing is we recommend putting an annual bottoms up budget together. Once that budget is done, that is locked. So that's gonna tell you what you think your revenue is gonna be for the year and what your profits are gonna be for the year. And that's your target, okay? You cannot move the target. The target is locked in stone. The next thing we do is we teach people is how to close the books every month so that you can compare actuals to, uh, to that original budget, okay? And then from there, we send out an email to the leadership team when the books are closed that lets people know this is what the budget was, this is what the actuals were, and most importantly, the why behind it. What were the reasons that that changed? Uh, we work on trying to get everyone to a four-day business close if possible. Some different industries have different nuances. And then on the eighth business day, we try to give them insights into uh, how do they actually perform. Then we also do something what is called a reforecast, which is every April, July, and September. That is going through the same budgeting process, but it's now that you are further along and you have more information and you have some actuals, it gives you an idea of, are you on track with your original budget? Uh, are you behind schedule or are you above schedule? But the most important thing is, expense management. So by having this insight, you can ensure that you're not overspending if you're behind schedule or if you're ahead of schedule, you might have more dollars that you could invest. And then the last component is something called a revenue analysis report, which is every month you really want to get an idea of what's the next 90 days look like and compare that to your original budget. So it, I, I recognize it's a lot there, but the point is all of this financial infrastructure what it does is it allows you to ensure that you're spending your time and money in the areas that's going to allow you to grow faster. Okay. And it, it might sound complex in this podcast, but I, I can assure you, once you get in the groove, it actually makes your life easier. The, the way I equate it is if you wash your dishes every night, washing your dishes is not that bad. If you exactly. don't wash your dishes every <laughs> night, you let them pile up, it becomes really arduous. Think of financing and budgeting and accounting as the same thing. If you're doing this every single day, it's not a ton of work. It's when you leave it to the last minute, not only do you not get the insights, but then it becomes a big headache. You got to clean everything up, et cetera. Yeah. And, and uh, you're making these decisions off of data, off of an ob objective findings rather than yep. a gut feel. Exactly. It's a data-driven approach to running your business. Yeah. Um, organizational design. All right. Yeah. Um, talk about some of the lessons you learned, maybe hard lessons and uh, good lessons you learned at Rise Interactive and how you've come to this uh, low hanging fruit for people to see organizational design as such an important piece of this puzzle. You know, I got incredibly lucky. There, there was a, one of my mentors uh, is a person named Jack Kraft is the former chief operating officer of Leo Burnett. He was a member of the advisory board at Rise. And when I was 22 years old, uh, I, I got incredibly lucky that he would give me a lot of his time. And he taught me about organizational design at a very young age. And I remember he asked me about the reporting structure and I started writing down the names of the people of my company because I started at my first agency at age 22. And he said, no, 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 not the people who start working there now, how do you organize all the talent? And it was just a light bulb that went on for me. And so when I started Rise, I actually wrote on a sheet of paper, myself as the CEO, and I wrote all of the groups in terms of operations, finance, sales, marketing, uh, innovation. Now my name was in every single one of those seats, but I recognized that I was 
you know, I recognized what hat I was putting on. And my goal was to continually remove my name from the departmental heads. You know, in my current structure, uh, I have someone in charge of every group except for marketing and product development right now. And my goal by the end of the year is that my names will be removed from those two seats as well. So now I have a leader in place um, in each one of those areas. Now, there are different levels. I have people from coordinator to director to vice president in different seats right now based on the investments I'm able to do as a startup. Uh, so I've been very fortunate that I've, I've taken this seriously from the very beginning. Uh, and I have every single role very well defined in terms of what people are supposed to do. Uh, but what I can tell you is more what I see from my clients is A, they haven't thought about this before. And B, a lot of people, even if they have thought about it, are still doing work that others should be doing. You know, so um, now I can tell you my own personal weakness is something I'm working very hard in this company to do differently than I did at, at Rise is one of the things I talk about is what does it take to be a data-driven leader or a growth leader? And one of them is to build a scalable team, you need to empower others to do their jobs and trust them to do it and let go. Well, that's one of my weaknesses. Is I, And I think a lot of it deals with impatience uh, where I want to get something done and it's on someone else's plate, but they have 18 other things on their plate. So I just start doing their work. Okay, A, that doesn't empower them. Uh, B, I'm, I'm not staying in my lane and I'm not focused on my responsibilities. Uh, and so by having really well organizational structure and clearly outlining their roles and making sure that people stay in their lanes, um, where you're able to one, increase engagement in your team because you're empowering people to do their jobs, but you're also building that scalable infrastructure. Yeah. I could see myself doing the same thing, John. So I, okay. <laughs> um, I, I, I see myself in that too. Um, talk about, you know, there's different levels that you grew to um, and that you had to implement a leadership team in at, at Rise Interactive. And you talk about this in reaching whatever it is, 10 people, 25 people, 100 people. Yep. What were some of the, I get inflection points uh, of when you grew and you had to kind of put in uh, different maybe leadership or different uh, organizational design? So a um, couple things. One, uh, what you should recognize is that when you get to about 20 or 25 people and when you get to 100 people, the infrastructure you need is very different. Okay. Generally, when you build out your infrastructure initially, you're building out the infrastructure as a CEO who runs everything. Okay. But when you get to 25 people, all of a sudden you start having a leadership team and you have to start taking different documents or different tools and having user rights, just as an example. So let's just say you create a budget and that budget is designed just for the CEO to see, but now you want other people to be able to input elements of the budget, but you don't want them to see the whole thing. So you have to start developing infrastructure that allows those different leaders to have access to the tools that they need. Uh, if you can prepare for that, you can make that transition a lot smoother versus uh, it'll automatically create friction if you don't have the right infrastructure at that point. The second thing, going back to my comment of letting go earlier, uh, one of the first learnings I had as a CEO is I had an account manager, uh, it was actually uh, Larry Fisher, who's now the CEO of Rise, but at the time he was an account manager and uh, we were having trouble with someone on his team. And he came in to talk to me about that person. And I said, well, you know, I have good news for you. I, I let them go to you today. So you don't have to worry about that person anymore. Uh, we were about 17 people at this point. And his response to me was, you know, John, my team is never going to respect me if you make every decision for me. And that was a key learning moment that I had to start empowering the people who report into me for them to do their jobs. And I can't, I can't sit there and make all their decisions. Uh, so that was a, a key milestone, a key learning. What I'd say also, when you get to a hundred employees, 
Now, all of a sudden, your leaders need to provide the tools and the resources for their leaders. And so the infrastructure, once again, splits and fractures. Uh, and the other part, when you get to about 250, is you really start building what I consider as more of an ecosystem. So, um, you know, if you have, let's just say, a CRM tool, and that's what the CRM tool is used for the sales team, well, that CRM tool might be used for helping us populate reports, and it might be used for, you know, your contracts, and it might be used for the client service team to gather data out of it. And so this ecosystem means that you, you, you have less flexibility for just one group to uh, switch the tools that they want to use, that they have to recognize mm -hmm. that it's going to have a bigger impact to the entire organization. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It trickles to all the other pieces that have to happen yeah. for that client. So it's like, oh, we're going to switch. Like, no, because yeah. that triggers like 10 other things with, with the other departments. Yep, exactly. Yeah. Um, what about, and you've talked about this before, as a CEO, you had to change as a CEO into different yep. levels. Yeah, so there, there are actually four different types of CEOs. Uh, the first is a startup CEO. Okay, a startup CEO is generally for between zero to 25 employees. The next is a growth CEO. Uh, that is uh, generally between 25 and probably 250, 300 people. Uh, at, at that point, you're really acting more as like an operating CEO. So uh, you are still very much in the weeds of the elements of the running the business. Then when you get about 250, 300 to about 1,000 employees, uh, you are what is considered a strategic CEO. You know? And this is where you have leaders in place that are really solid in every single element of the business. And your job is more about the vision of the company, steering the ship, but it is less about you know, being in the minutia of the day-to-day -day aspects of the business. And then the last one is, I would say, is the mega organization CEO. You know, and at this point, you're more of a figurehead. Uh, so there's still the, the strategic components of the business, but you also are, you know, very visible, you know, from a uh, figurehead, a, you know, you know, presence in the public type role. John, I always ask since Inspired Insider, thanks for sharing that because as people sure. kind of, move up different levels it's good to kind of think of you just have to think about it differently you know yep. and, and just like you had mentors someone's going to listen to this interview and and this is going to be their their uh, uh mentorship i guess you could say yeah. um you know since it's inspired inside i always ask what's been a low moment a really challenging time uh in the company and then what's been an especially proud moment in with rise interactive as you look back you know, a low moment is probably also a proud moment. Uh, so in 2011, uh, we were still a small company and I uncovered an email string uh, between seven of our probably 17 to 20 employees. And it was literally by accident of someone forwarding it to the entire company as opposed to this small group. Uh, and what it was is they, it was a daily attack privately on another employee. Mm. And there are just some horrific things that were happening in the organization. Uh, I mean, so just horrific things they were saying. And I'm a huge believer in culture and I'm a huge believer in creating an amazing place to work. And at the end of the day, these people just did not represent the core values uh, of my organization. Uh, and the challenge was that we were doubling uh, as an organization from a revenue standpoint. So I had a ton of open roles and I'm trying to hire to fill these roles. And several of these people were my star employees. You know, they are some of the more talented employees. Within 90 days, all seven of those people were gone. And some immediately, some over a 90 day period, because I, I couldn't literally do it as a light switch. I had to do it on my on my terms as opposed to their terms is the way I looked at it. Um, so 
Uh, it's a tough decision so, to make. I mean, it's not a tough decision, but it is a tough decision based on there's a lot of things that you needed for the business and you didn't want it, the, the customers to suffer either. So. Exactly. And so the, the proud moment is one that I not only made the right decision, but the amount of pain um, that not just emotionally in terms of like what happened, but literally it took a year to unwind the damage of that. And, uh, you know, multiple 18 hour days trying to do the work of those seven people as we're hiring new people, onboarding them. Uh, you know, I, I call it the dark days of rise. So um, that was a, a very challenging year during that time period. How do you now, or looking at that, hire for culture better? It's actually part of the program. So one of the things we talk about is focus and alignment. With every single company, we help them create their core values. Okay. Our core values at Ramsey's spells grow and it's to grow personally, respect every interaction, outstanding work and wisdom shared. And there, in order to make your core values real, it has to be part of your hiring. It has to be part of your firing and it has to be part of your promotion strategy. So when you interview, you don't just interview for competence, you interview for, you know, are they going to adhere to these core values? And it's not like a light switch where it's like, okay, day one, these are your core values. It takes time to build the right questions, to build exams, to think about how you incorporate that into your hiring process. Uh, we also teach everyone to have quarterly conversations with their, um, with every manager should be having a quarterly conversation with their direct report. And one of the things you discuss is how are they doing in terms of living up to those core values? Uh, and ultimately, it is beholden on the company to make sure that the core values are real by having it incorporated into the hiring, the firing, and the uh, promotional strategy. Love it. You can't, you can't have a star player who's a complete jerk yeah. and promote them and expect that people think that your core values are real. Yeah. You have to have alignment or people, people see right through that stuff. Exactly. First of all, John, thank you. Yeah. Um, I, you know, uh, you know, I do a lot of research for these, so I, I've listened to you and, and I always, you know, love listening to you in person and sharing your wisdom and any person who is a business owner, this is invaluable information. So I appreciate you sharing it. And I have one last question before I ask it, uh, where should people learn more? Where should people find you online? Uh, for your website? So there's two places, ramseyinnovations.com. So you can always go to our website. Uh, but also if you follow me personally on LinkedIn, I am adding daily business tips on how to grow your company. So go to ramseyinnovation.com, check it out. Innovation. Innovations, plural, got it. Yep. Ramseyinnovations.com, check it out. Last question, John, is... I know for you and for me, one of the biggest things is learning from people who have done it or are doing it and mentors. I'm wondering who are the mentors? It could be colleagues, friends. I know you mentioned Jack Kraft as a, as a really influential mentor of yours. Who are other mentors that have influenced you and helped you in this journey? Absolutely. So Larry Fisher, the current CEO of Rise, I've learned a ton from him. Um, Eric Ashworth and Joel Quadracci and Kelly Vanderboom, who are on our board at Quad Graphics, uh, learned a ton from them. Uh, David Freeman, Cheryl Berman, uh, Chris McGowan were all advisors and mentors of mine at Rise. Um, so those would be a few of the of the people, you know. But what what I would say is for anybody who's looking for mentorship and leadership, find the area that you're weak in and find experts within that specific area. So every time I wanted to pick an advisor, there was something very specific I wanted to learn along that, those ways. Awesome. Thank you, John. Everyone check out ramseyinnovations.com. Learn more. If you listen to the earlier part and you are a fit to, and this sounds great to you, contact John and let him know. So thanks everyone. 
Appreciate right, you. Son. Thank you so much. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, like psycho peach, if you find the same right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand.